All right, welcome. I am Dr. Anna Smith, and I'd like to welcome you to the Creatively Critical Tech Research Design Practice Speaker Series. I have some introductory remarks, and while I make, make them, I welcome those of you joining today to introduce yourself in the chat. You can find the chat button at the bottom of your screen, um, and, and then please make sure to shift from uh, where it says hosts and panelists, change that to everyone so that we can all um, see who's joining us today. We are keeping the chat open for most for the most dialogic experience possible, so please respect that and keep your comments uh, productive. So the critically uh, the creatively critical tech series comes to us from the Education Now Lab at Illinois State University and the School of Teaching and Learning. The, the Education Now Lab is a community engaged research practice lab that works with and produces a range of critical, interdisciplinary, public, academic, and new media scholarship with and alongside community members as we labor toward more just educational futures. We are hosting this series as part of a co course called Critical Perspectives on Technology and Education. And we are recording and sharing resources from each of these talks online um, at an at a address I will share in just a moment. And you can currently go there to see recordings from our previous sessions in the series. Uh, this is the screen you're seeing right now. This is our talk tonight. Um, upcoming is one from uh, Dr. Phil Nichols and Mr. Samuel Reed uh, from the U School, um, it, it, talking about innovation from below, building infrastructures for transformative education. So you can still register for that one, but if you've missed a session, you can see all of our previous sessions here below. Uh, we also wanna thank Fakayo Olutomoa for her work on managing our lab online presence and accessibility. So thank you, Fakayo. And we also want to welcome and thank our ASL interpreter tonight, Shelley Zimmerman. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, the series is, so with that, I'm actually gonna stop share for a minute <laughs> so I can see the chat as well. All right, the series is co-sponsored by the Illinois State University Office of Research and Graduate Studies and the College of Education. And we thank them for their generous support. And in that we, we recognize and we are working to make meaningful that Illinois State University is built on the land and waters of multiple indigenous nations who were forcibly removed, including the Illini, Peoria, and the Miami, and later due to colonial en encroachment and displacement to the Fox, Potawatomi, Sauk, Shawnee, Winnebago, Iowa, Muscotin, Piankasha, Wea, and Kickapoo Nations. And we also honor the indigenous people who have been excluded due to historical erasure and inaccuracy. And I've been thinking as, as we're currently seeing the sustained struggles and atrocities of people related to peoples and lands in the horrific um, current events, I hope we can dedicate our insights and energies that are gained from tonight to whatever action we can do that's best for our mutual um, critical humanization. Um, and I know we'll have some ins insights tonight. Uh, tonight, we're, we're pleased to be joined by members of the editorial team of La Quinta. Um, I will introduce the founders of this project and they will introduce some of their editorial team. So we'll be in introduced or we'll be joined by Alex Dick, uh, who is uh, who was born and raised in Sinaloa, Mexico. She is an artist and storyteller living in Los Angeles. Her contributions as producer and filmmaker have screened at film festivals across the globe. Through her work as a filmmaker, writer, and storyteller, she has been leading voice and organizer around issues of immigration, homelessness, and human rights. She has worked closely with leading activist networks and founded a nonprofit focused on supporting homeless communities in California. She's currently writing a book, The Cost of Convenience, telling um, the many tolls experienced by undocumented individuals in the United States. Um, Ontario Garcia is an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University, and his research explores the possibilities of speculative imagination and healing in educational research. Prior to completing his PhD, Garcia was an English teacher at a public high school in South Central Los Angeles. His research, recent research explores learning and literacies in tabletop role-playing games, such as um, Dungeons and Dragons, and civic learning possibilities in various learning environments. His recent books include All Around the Town, The School Bus's Educational Technology, 
everyday advocacy, teachers who change the literacy narrative, and civics for the world to come, committing uh, to democracy for every classroom. Antero currently co-edits La Cuenta, an online publication centering the voices and perspectives of individuals labeled undocumented in the US. So with that, I will um, turn the time over uh, to um, uh, Alex and um, Antero. Thank you. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna work on sharing the screen. And Anna, thanks for those kind uh, and lengthy bios. So sorry, thanks for, for <laughs> those. Um, I think you can see the, can you see our slides? Is that, does that work? Okay. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think that's just gonna work. I'm gonna find our chat in a second so I can use that too. Okay. Um, we're, thank you. We're, we're uh, Ontario and Elise. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're really excited to just kind of talk through how we got through, got into doing the work that we call La Cuenta. Uh, and share some of the powerful voices of a couple of other folks who are joining us today. Um, would you want to kind of talk through what our plan looks like for today? Of course. Hello, everyone. Uh, the plan for today would be to introduce La Cuenta and what is it in our three whys, which is centering voice, challenging technology, and redefining research. And we're going we're gonna to really have like a particular focus in this work on kind of thinking through methodology and the purposes of research you, you know, I, I come at this from an educational research perspective, uh, and so that's going to be driving some of our mm -hmm. conversation. Um, and at the very end, uh, we're going to have a deviation to discuss school buses. Anna mentioned uh, a recent book on school buses, so there's going to be this kind of like abrupt shift. But we're going to we're going to try to pull it back at the end too. So I want to, in order to talk about why La Cuenta and what we mean by it, um, I'm going to read a kind of lengthy excerpt uh, from a, an interview we had recently. So. Um, last month, we talked with Rafael Agustin. Uh, he's a writer for uh, Jane the Virgin. Um, he's been deeply involved with um, the Writers Guild strike when that was still happening. Um, and he wrote a book, Illegally Yours, which is a memoir. We actually crossed paths when, um, when we were both baby undergrads a long time ago at UCLA. Um, and, and we asked him during our interview, uh, we said uh, to Rafael, La Cuenta gets its name from the idea of imagining a bill to America for the cost of what it means to be undocumented. So what did it cost you to live in America while you were undocumented? What would you put on your bill? And Raphael re uh, responded back to us. He didn't write this. This was in a Zoom conversation. They said, uh, to be completely honest, because luckily I came as a child, my La Quinta bill would be actually about my parents because I stopped to consider that these are two people in their prime working in the United States. They got their entire education paid for by a different go government. An entirely different government paid for them to become medical doctors. And then that government didn't benefit from their labor. It was the United States of America who did not pay for any of that. So my bill is about my parents. It's their development, their education, and their expertise, their medical degrees, all of that, which this country didn't have to pay for and benefited from greatly. Mm -hmm. And so, at least you want to introduce kind of, uh, kind of our next activity? Yeah, of course. Um, we would like you guys to explore La Cuenta. So this is the link. And these are more than 90 costs that we have shared and explored during our first year with La Cuenta. And we would like you guys to see what looks interesting for you, to click on it. And we would like to, to give you a few minutes for you to, yeah. to see what La Cuenta is about for yourself. Yeah, so maybe we can take, uh, and yeah, Anna, thanks for making a, a, a real URL. Thank um, you. But maybe, maybe take like four-ish, four and a half minutes now because we've rambled. Uh, we're going to mute ourselves while, while you do that. Uh, and then we'll come back and we're going to ask you to kind of share what you saw either uh, in by speaking or on chat just as a heads up but let's take about four and a half minutes to do that please
Let, we'll take about one more minute, please. Uh, and then um, and then we're gonna have you um, speak with us in a minute. So just to just to be clear, because we kind of threw you at this um at this URL. This is this captures we last month we celebrated our, the first anniversary, mm -hmm. the first full year of La Puenta. And this was my very loose qualitative coding of um of the kinds of costs that we had here. And so yeah, if, I think uh Anna and Viraj, if you if you got sucked into one, that's great, right? Um and so what we're hoping is maybe either unmuting if you if you'd like to be a part of the conversation or or in the chat. Kind of share what's something you saw or what's something that you noticed or if any questions arose for you let's take a, just a moment to kind of hear what people are noticing or, or thinking about or maybe resonating i um i read the piece on uh college degree and something that popped in my mind was oftentimes there's this dialogue about opportunity that it's such an opportunity it's such a privilege to be able to have an American education to be in this space to learn at a higher degree but the conversation about the cost of that opportunity is often not had in terms of like what are uh, what are some fears some uncertainties some things that we may be giving up for those um, are not readily discussed and when they are they're often discussed in um unhelpful ways for the individual going through these particular things. So that was something that popped up. I love that. Thank you. And I'm not positive which college piece you read. Uh, don't, don't don't tell me because it's actually it will keep me in suspense. But it's poten potentially the author of that piece might be on our call right now. We'll find out in a second. But, um, but really appreciate yeah, the push on opportunity cost. Coming up. Let's hear from maybe one more person or throw some stuff in the chat if you'd like. I read the poetry piece with Jose Olivares um, and the idea of wanting to do more and be more than just replicate and reproduce some of those, those stories that he both inherited and learned. And the idea of his voice being sandwiched in between those two white mainstream voices, but then ending it with a beautiful gesture of the open colon. It just was, it was quite moving. Yeah, I, I got to be honest. When I asked him that question, because I, I love that we love that poem, Ars Poetica, and Christians actually, who's on the call, and we'll introduce her in a moment, um, uh, is who encouraged us to talk about that poem with Jose. And so, thank you, Christian, for for the push there. Um, but when we said like, "Hey, do you know, it's like you, your your poem is all like there's all these white people in this poem," I think he felt a little felt a certain way about pointing that out. Right? <laughs> it's a different thing, but Rebecca, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and then I, I saw some notes. I'm just going to read some things from the chat, if that's okay. Um, but Joshua said, this makes me think of NPR's This I Believe, with a focus on shedding light on unspoken areas. Uh, I really like that. Uh, Heather, I uh, he said, I was drawn into the into the being multilingual story, multilingual versus monolingual, and how being multilingual is an asset, not a deficit. I think that's the interview with uh, my colleague, uh, Ramon Martinez. That was actually the first research interview oh, that, that, the first um, that the two of us did, and then we ran it months, months later. Um, and so, yeah, really, uh, thank you all for kind of engaging with this work. We're gonna we're gonna pivot and kind of talk about the the why and like what's this what's this work look like for us. Um, once I can get our slides back up here, okay. Okay, so as you can see, and as we share, La Cuenta is all about documenting the cost of surviving in America if you are undocumented. And we do a couple of different ways first. La Cuenta is focused on challenging who counts as an expert today and utilizing uh, stories to shape how we understand and how we see the world. 
too often university professors do research on communities like the undocumented community instead of us speaking about it when we are the expertise over boys it's the research and this is what La Cuenta is about mm -hmm. and one of our um one of our whys is that we take seriously that immigrants are more than numbers even though that's usually as the media refer to us only numbers we want to turn the tools of economics upside down to center human dignity. And so, as, as Luke pointed out, there's, there's these three reasons of kind of why we spend this time publishing on La Cuenta every week. Uh, and really the first the first thing that we want to talk about is, as Luke was alluding to, is this idea of reframing whose voice and whose expertise counts when we talk about immigration or any topic, right? When we talk about education, how often do teachers and students and community members and parents mm -hmm actually show up in that conversation, right? I think that's just been, um, say as an educational researcher, my, my goal is to uh, remove myself, uh, like make make our jobs as researchers obsolete. Sorry, Anna. Like, I, I think our goal, my goal is to like remove us, right? Like, like other people should be at the center of this work. Um, and so with that, uh, you know, I, I have a tremendous amount of privilege that I get to work with. Uh, Alix, I think, I think she's brilliant. And I also think we have this amazing editorial team that's been working with us for a while. Um, and so I wanna introduce um, Laura Villalobos and Christian Pena, who've been working with us for different kinds of capacities. I'm gonna ask both, I'm gonna give you a heads up. I'm gonna ask you both to unmute in a moment. Uh, and I'll ask you, Laura, first to say kind of, who are you? How did you end up doing this with us? Like what, what was the process that led you into this space? And so uh, Laura, if you don't mind uh, jumping in, kind of sharing, introducing yourself for us. Hello everybody. Thank you for joining us today in this presentation. Uh, my name is Laura, and I've been collaborating with La Cuenta since I was, uh, so I guess going back to my introduction, actually. So I am a recent Stanford grad and um, an artist. I began working with uh, Dr. Garcia and Alex, and Alex Dick um, the summer of 2022 while I was still pursuing my undergraduate studies. Um, and shortly after that, um, we began working with La Cuenta. So I have been with them since the beginning. Initially, I was doing um, a lot of research uh, work, um, preparing for um, the cost of convenience, the book, and you know, really just working behind the scenes. Um, and then I began writing some pieces for La Cuenta itself. Um, why am I part of this team? So I, I am very passionate about my work and my collaboration with La Cuenta and the work that um, Dr. Garcia and Alix are doing. I think that it's very important, um, particularly, again, within the undocumented community um, to uplift the voices of the people that are not being heard. Um, again, kind of like referencing to what Dr. Garcia was talking about, um, and at least as well, um, when it comes to the undocumented community, when it's seen in the media, it's often seen through like numbers um, or kind of just like this monolith fictional um, yeah. image that we are portrayed through, um, which is oftentimes not informed by real stories. Um, and oftentimes, again, it's more harmful um, than helpful and actually addressing the issues that affect the undocumented community. Um, so with my my work and collaboration with La Cuenta, um, I make it my goal to uplift these stories and to uplift the voices, um, emphasizing that we are not a monolith and that there are many stories that make up the undocumented experience um, and community. Um, and they should be highlighted individually, not just brought into and wrapped um, into this um, image that is not representative of the community. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and just to, I'll, I'll say it again, I said at the beginning, but the art that you can see here that says La Cuenta on it, that uh, Laura just kind of jotted that off one afternoon. I think it was kind of incredible. She, she just texted us. Oh, by the way, I made this art if you want to use it. It was, uh, um, so just kind of has yeah, some, it. yeah, it's, it's incredible. We're going to put on t-shirts or something soon. Haven't sold this yet. We're going to, we're going to get rich off of this art, Laura. Um, 
And then I, the other person I want to introduce is uh, Christian Pena. Someone in the chat mentioned reading the, the piece about mothering as an undocumented uh, mother. Uh, and that is a piece that um, Christian wrote. I think it's a, a beautiful piece. And so Christian, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Christian. Um, I am a writer. I just recently started pursuing the writing. Um, and then I met Antero on Substack who happened to ask if I wanted to write for La Cuenta. And this piece that I wrote um, about being an undocumented mother sort of kind of just uh, jumped out at me as I was writing. It was like probably the first story that I felt um, that I could tell because it was very a traumatic experience for me. So it was probably the first time that I was able to sit down and process something about my life as an undocumented person because you know, being undocumented is sort of just, it's, you just are undocumented. Um, having DACA, you just have DACA. You don't really go about your life thinking about it in that way. And it wasn't until I became a mother and entered the medical system and the government system where I was like, oh, this is, this is very difficult as an undocumented person. And so writing that essay for La Cuenta really allowed me to think about myself um, in this world as an undocumented person. And um, it was the first time that somebody wanted to talk to me about my undocumented experience um, with, La, with La Cuenta, exploring what being undocumented is and not being lumped, as Laura said, into this monolith of being an undocumented person. And I write a little bit for my own newsletter here and there. And um, just about, you know, personal essays about my life. That's pretty much what I do. And I'm really grateful for La Cuenta because they sent her people's stories. Um, and writing is such a sacred thing and being able to write your own story is such a sacred thing. So I'm really grateful for La Cuenta and Antero and Alix. So thank you. Thank, thank you both. I, and just, uh, Christian, you mentioned you have a, we, I think we found you, because I think you might've made a comment or liked a post, but then we started following your uh, Substack and really like, love to get your your involvement. And so uh, we're I'm juggling lots of stuff on our end. So please put the link to your Substack so folks can check it out if, if you uh, okay. if you can put in here. Um, I'm going to put up a picture of a postcard. And Alex, you want to you want to describe kind of what this is? Of course. Uh, and before I go there, I just want to say how grateful we are for Christian and Laura. They that La Cuenta wouldn't be possible without you guys, and we are just so grateful to. For you guys to share your heart the way that you do and and to share your art and um yeah so um i would like you guys to get to know this postcard that we created how long ago was it like uh, i think it's a, maybe a year a little over a year ago uh, maybe a year and a half a year, we'll round maybe, up. Yeah. something around that uh so this is the postcard and as you know la cuenta is about defining the financial social and personal cost of living with the label of being undocumented. And based on your own perspectives, uh, what is something you might put on the bill? Yeah, so yeah, Christian and Laura, you both kind of named some of these abstractly on La Cuenta, so you might want to recycle one of those and kind of share what would go on your bill. Or if you if there's something fresh on your mind now, feel free to, the floor is yours to name maybe a new cost or, or an existing cost for you. Uh, I don't know which of you would like to go first. I'll go first. I can share first. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, one of the costs. Oh man. One of them. Um, I think I would say. I mean, in my own personal experience, it would be. Um, it cost a lot of like my experience with motherhood. Um, I spent so much time worrying about um, getting medical care, like the very basics of medical care, that I didn't get to enjoy. Um, being a mom or you know like it pregnant because I didn't really have that option um, not having the medical care that I needed so that's one cost which is huge it really affected my relationship with pregnancy um, and uh, beyond that with the medical system I think that's probably a huge cost is for me and I think that was the first essay you wrote for La Cuenta, and it is, it's really powerful. So um, I know at least one of you read it in the chat, and if you haven't, please please go check that out. It really, it was, uh, 
it's really powerful and I think vulnerable piece of writing to share with us. Thank you. Laura, beat that. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a cause that um, I would like to share is the ability to plan ahead. Um, it's very abstract. And I think that's something that La Cuenta um, is trying to emphasize as well. It's like, how do you put a cost to these abstract things that you just can't get back, um, that you can't reconcile with even just the dollar amount? Um, to me, like the ability to plan ahead, um, as to many members of the undocumented community, um, is something that is taken away from us um, due to the uncertainty of every day. Um, I think that, you know, and, and a lot of the collaborations and stories that I try to emphasize, just like the, the intense gravity of not being able to plan for your future. Um, when you get a college degree, um, not being able to plan what you're going to be able to do with that college degree due to your inability to enter your field and start your career. Um, I think there's also like this notion of like, or there, there could be this notion of, you know, like undocumented issues only affect you while you're undocumented and undocumented label is not something that um, is permanent, though in many cases it could be um, something that, you know, people die while they're undocumented. Um, but, you know, even those that get the chance to um, gain citizenship residency at some point, like the cost of being undocumented continues to follow them, um, whether that is you know, all the opportunities that you missed out, all the plans that you were not able to make, um, and even just like the mental, social, and economic costs that being undocumented um, has, like those costs that have accumulated over that time. Thank you. I, I, wanna, I wanna just highlight, I'm realizing this is now mansplaining powerful things that both Christian and, and Laura have, have pointed out too. But you know the costs of being able, not being able to plan ahead, and the cost of the loss of motherhood, right, and the, the loss of enjoying pregnancy and motherhood, right. I think are um, there. There is no dollar value to those, right? Like, and so we want to recognize the irony of asking for this invoice, mm -hmm. but also naming right these very human costs. And so to that, right, I think when we created these postcards. Um, we did it kind of sharing Alix's story. Do you want to share kind of the first cost that we kind of named as part of this work? Yeah, of course. And uh, like you guys said, it's impossible just to think of one cause when I feel like since I immigrated to the United States, that cause been piling up and piling up and piling up and they don't seem to get any response back. But uh, one that I wrote on this postcard, uh, which by the way, we've I would love to send you one. <laughs> yep, you um, send one of the biggest ones that I went through when I immigrated to the United States, I was living in uh, this little town called Gainesville, Georgia. That was like 12 years ago. And at that time, my English was so bad. I could barely say numbers and colors. <laughs> and unfortunately, you have to survive. And the first job that I got was at this Mexican restaurant. And I, this was 12 years ago, by the way. So I just started like experiencing a lot of pain on my left side um, on one of my molars. And it was just bad. And I was like, it's going to get better. Maybe it's just like a cavity or something like that. It's going to get better. And I just like tried to survive with Tylenol and whatever I could get. And like chewing on on different herbs and things like that. I I I even chew on a time with garlic, and I was chewing on it the whole day, and nothing really helped. And next to the restaurant, there was this dentist, and I remember thinking to myself, like, this is my first experience in the United States. I I used to come here for vacations, but never actually understood how things work. And I went there and I talked to the dentist as I could because my English was so bad, but the dentist was so nice and he was trying to understand what I was saying. And I was like, ouch, ouch, you know, like trying to, to explain him that I was dying out of pain. And uh, he said, okay, I'll do an x-ray and we'll see what, what's happening there. And he said, there's so much infection and this is very dangerous. Uh, it can go to your brain. It can go to other parts of your body because it's really big. So 
we we need to do a let's just start with a root canal so I was like okay good yeah I have all day you know like I talked to myself yeah finally I have the answer so I sat down and he's like uh and the down payment to start this process would be fifteen hundred dollars and I just got to the United States I barely make any tips you can only imagine like how bad those tips were if I could barely communicate so I was like okay just give me a little bit of time I find a loan or I find a way to pay uh, I'll come back in a few days and those few days turn into weeks and those weeks turn into months so after many months trying to get a loan trying to figure that out uh, I, I still didn't have the money after eight or eight uh, seven or eight months I don't have the exact time and one day the pain like around 3 a.m 4 a.m I woke up and I felt something wet around my neck and I look and it was blood and I remember thinking to myself well what what's that coming from and and, and I could hear this like, like in my ear and I was so confused and and I I told my roommate to take me to the ER and they saw me and they were like well, you're basically, there was infection in your ear and your ear pretty much exploded. And to not make the story longer than it is, uh, basically since that moment, I have not been able to hear well. So the the left side is so difficult. I, I'm often like asking people to repeat. I struggle so much to hear because the right side only works. So for me to think, that's a cause it's it's almost like laughable a cause what like no there is no amount of money that could either get me my hearing back or going back to those years and like I, I I look back on it and I'm like I cannot believe uh these doctors saw the pain that I was experiencing and there there was no way for them to help me even if they tried to so that was one of the first cause but I have a lot of them. <laughs> if you do it three more hours, I'd be happy to tell you. And so, you know, we want to we want to kind of name the irony, right, of these these costs as if there's like a dollar value you can put on, right? Like yeah. On the invoice that shows, you know, we're we're charging the US for one year for a week, but you know, we, we there's no there's no dollar value you can put for some of these pieces. Mm -hmm. Um so that's our first why, right? Is the personal why. I wanna I wanna take a couple minutes and talk about the kind of uh the way I'm grumpy around digital technologies and digital literacies right now is maybe a second kind of why for this work. Um, and I was struck by this quote that's almost 30 years old at this point. So think of like the um, the like the dot com you know boom in the mid 90s, where when everyone everyone sees the kind of like beauty of what the internet is going to become. And during this time, um, this guy John Perry Barlow, who used to write for the Grateful Dead, and he, you know, he's kind of like a you know Palo Alto hippie dude. Um, he, he wrote the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. And I'm struck, I wrote a little bit about this with um, Roberto de Santiago de Rupe, um, but uh, it, at the beginning of the independence, um, uh, John Perry Barlow writes, uh, we're creating a world, he's talking about the internet, we're creating a world that all may enter without privilege or prejudice accorded by race, economic power, military force, or station of birth. We'll create a civilization of the mind in cyberspace. May it be more humane and fair than the world your governments have made before, right? This kind of very uh, utopian vision. And I actually think if you are a white cisgender male dude in America, right, that is a kind of like way that you might live in cyberspace, right? We can look at the thing now called X, right, as an example of like how people might proliferate and maintain power. Um, but often, like, I think this kind of utopian vision is not the is not the internet that we live in today and so you know we we host la cuenta on substack right it is it is a platform that's owned by a big corporate organization that's going to try to make money from other people uh and there are there are negative and awful people who also write on substack and there are awful people who are using zoom to cause harm in this country right uh and and in the world and so we want to recognize that you know, we're in this place now where we need to use the tools that we have to make things better, but also know that these tools are always actively kind of causing harm around us. There's, I also just want to think like, what do we mean by technology? Um, I, I think of, again, almost a 40 year old quote from my colleague Roy P here at Stanford, um, who describes technology, particularly cognitive technologies as reshaping who we are by changing what we do. A very obvious kind of definition. Um, don't say that to Roy, 
Um, but you know, I think I think the framing here is is really important just to recognize, you know, if we're using different tools, how are they changing us? Let's be really intentional with that, right? So Substack as a tool is yes, a place where we can get out stories, but it should also be a place where we might crowdsource, find the humanity in each other, and kind of build off of the, the thinking from one another. Um, and this gets to the kind of question that I think has been driving my, my frustration both around this this work, around working with communities who are labeled as undocumented, not a label that they've accepted, right, but a label that's been placed upon individuals, um, as well as I think if we look in the world right now and we think about global conflict and we think about the ways that we avoid talking about things like um, uh, ethnic cleansing happening right now uh, and uh, instead saying these issues are complicated, right? We use the word complicated to refuse to actually engage in these topics. I just wanna think about like, what good are digital tools uh, if they don't allow us to see the humanity in one another, if they don't allow us to find ways to repair, to build forward, to use mutual aid, right? And I think, you know, uh, we'll talk later about the kinds of methodologies that we've been using in our work, but they are messy, right? Our methodologies are are analog, they're, they're paper, they are photos, they are, um, they're tiers, right? Like they're, they're, those are the kinds of tools that we use for our research. Um, and so speaking of research, right, the, the last why for us is? Uh, our true why is about changing research and what it means to do research. We actually have four different ways of what it means for us. So the first is that our research is public. Every Thursday, including tomorrow, uh, we publish a story on La Cuenta, right? It goes up, it goes up usually around 7.20 in the morning, uh, Pacific time. Uh, which is around when I wake up, right? That's that's when you click the button. Um, there's no paywalls. Uh, the peer review is the world, right? This all the work of La Cuenta will not go in any other space, but in a place that is accessibly that is accessible to the world for free, right? We're we're very intentional about that as the kind of work that we're thinking about. Yeah, and the next way we want to change research is by centering and storytelling. Um, we don't tell you stories and then analyze them. Instead, the voices and experience on La Cuenta become our research. And we are so grateful that every week our contributors, Laura and Christian, have shared their heart with the world, which I fully understand that it's not an easy task. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but all of us take really seriously this work and, and the responsibility that comes with it. And so, yeah, and actually maybe... Christian and, and Laura, we, we have a question for both of you. If you have some thoughts, and we're gonna spring this on you, so you might not have, you might say pass, um, or just pretend like uh, your internet breaks or something. But that is the like, how do you how do you decide what to share with La Cuenta, right? Like it is it is a weirder kind of space. Um, Christian, I know you've experienced different kinds of pushback for for at least for one of the posts that you've shared, and you don't need to necessarily go into that. But I'm curious from both of you, like, how do you decide what to share, and how do like when you've experienced pushback, what's that felt like for for either of you? I think for me, um, it's very like what's happening in the moment um, that inspires me to share. Um, for example, like around the time that I wrote like the college piece and I, I had that collaborative interview, um, somebody that's very close to me was going through that issue themselves. And, you know, in the moment, I was just kind of thinking about like, I can't believe that this is happening to them. Um, so maybe I would even say like a sense of disbelief that something so treacherous could happen just because of this undocumented label, um, affecting the real lives of real people. Um, and you know, these stories going unnoticed is what compels me to share. Um, there's definitely a, always a risk of pushback. And I think, you know, Something that's very prominent within the undocumented community is fear. Um, I think that it's very central to our experience, um, the fear of being discovered, the fear of, you know, the constant threat of deportation um, and the criminalization of our community um, is something that's really real. Um, but I think that it's also, you know, fear could also be a very, it's a very powerful emotion that could also inspire change um, and inspire movement um, for some people. And I think that for that reason, um, 
fear could also be inspirational in a way that compels us to push back uh, on the institutions and systems that are um, driving like this fear. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, the third way we think about research is about as both personal and dialogic. And one of the things I was thinking about when we were doing this is a few weeks ago, I was working with one of my closest friends who has so many stories to share and she's from Documente as well. And she she decided to write for us. And one day, like at six in the morning, she called me and she was like, I don't know how I feel about doing this. This just feels very uncomfortable. And I don't know if we'll, I ever read something like this online. And, and, and I don't know if I like that. And I told her, this is exactly why we do what we do, because would it, the world be different for us if we relate to these stories before, if we had somebody to look up and say, like, I also been through this and, and feel understood and seen mm -hmm. by one person. And I encourage her to, to realize that our uh, being vulnerable is our power. And we're going to publish her soon, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's in a couple of weeks. We'll, we'll publish that story. Um, the, so as, so as, as we've been talking through a story, La Quinta, you know, publishes, um, uh, other people's stories each week, but that's actually only half of the research that we've been doing. Um, oh, there's a book emoji on our slide, so you can't see. So just pretend that the slide you see has a big book emoji in the middle. <laughs> I just forgot to update the slide, but it's, it's a really, it's, it's the same emoji that's on your phone. It's on there. I really screwed it up. Um, but do you want to talk about the other side of the work? Um, of course. Yeah, for the... For the last, what, three years, we have been working on document my own experiences as a book, and we're actually dropping up now, uh, and it's called The Cost of Convenience, and it will be published by Beacon Press sometime in the ne near future, we, I still don't know when. Yeah, so so this uh, this is a, a book that we've been working on. This is this kind of, this book is like why we started doing this is we've spent so much time trying to understand how can we tell rather than tell you know 11 million people stories we're going to tell one person's stories the theory of change right mm -hmm. and then that led to La Quinta is the other side of this um but I want to talk a little bit about the research methods of this right this is this is a book that started from um weekly or bi-weekly platicas of the two of us kind of engaging in conversation that led to us interviewing experts in the field experts being other people who are labeled as undocumented experts being university researchers and professors. Um, it's led to deeply vulnerable kinds of writing and reflection. Sometimes that writing is like writing on paper uh, and taking pictures of it. Sometimes that writing it is- involves crying. It's sometimes it's, sometimes <laughs> it's a lot of that. Lots of tears. Uh, sometimes it's voice memos. Sometimes it's photos. Uh, the beginning, there's a, there's a selfie part of this that, that we've played with, right? There's lots of like playing with different kinds of tools, but those tools ultimately are about like, how do you capture humanity? How do you capture mm. feeling? How do you capture loss? Um, as we talk about research, though, I think, you know, my responsibility as an educational researcher at a university uh, is to do this work ethically and responsibly, uh, and that is governed by the Institutional Review Board at our university. Um, and so I'm talking about that experience, right, that, you know, I'm very familiar with doing IRBs. I think many of you on this call are, get to do them. They're really fun. We treat IRB like it's this bad thing. It's really there to protect us. I think it's there for important reasons. We can quibble with some of the pieces around it. And so I wrote up the full IRB and the IRB was, you know, we're going to be doing this kind of dialogic research together. I mean, they don't, the, the Stanford IRB doesn't know the word platica, but we talk about, you know, we're going to be engaging in these conversations together. We're going to be exploring the identity, the, the N, the, the number of participants is one. Um, and so when I, when I turned that in, this is the response uh, I got back uh, on July 9th in 2021. It said, um, thank you for your submission. This protocol is being returned to you because based on the information provided in this application, the IRB has determined that this project does not meet the definition of research as defined in blah, 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 which requires the results to contribute to generalizable knowledge. In the future, if you decide to increase the sample size of your study, please contact us uh, as your project may require IRB, right? And so it's basically like, uh, and, and so I've been sitting with this for a while of, you know, what's it mean for deeply personal work that I think goes further than, uh, I, I think something gets reduced if we if we double the participants, if we had two, uh, two participants. If we had 100 participants, the work gets watered down, right? Because it becomes generalizable, right? The insights here are because the leaks here experience isn't generalizable, right? Like your hearing loss 
is your hearing loss? And like, we can't do a survey and get that from other people, right? And so, you know, what's it mean to think about what counts as research is I think like a fundamental part that we've been sitting with. And for this to not quote unquote count as research means that we get to do this work and it's still kind of valid, uh, but it's just not, it doesn't count in the same kind of way. And I think the other thing I just want to name is that we think the last piece of this research uh, to kind of do some preliminary wrap up here um, is that we see this research as a kind of window and as a kind of weird uh, kind of mirror, you know, obviously kind of speaking back to the work of um, the great Rudin Sims Bishop in, in young adult literature scholarship. Um, to really think through what's it mean that you can go on Laquenta every week and maybe you get to see yourself in your experience, right? No one else has talked about motherhood in the way that Christian we've talked about. No one else has talked about the, the costs of not being able to plan forward and make making plans or making this kind of list of do's and don'ts that Lars pre presented on um, on the Quinta in the past, right? We don't see those pieces. And so you might see yourself or you might be invited to see someone else as if this is a window into a different kind of world. And so this has been kind of, you know, one of the other pieces we want to think about methodologically is take the mirror as a kind of method. We sound like I'm going to add anything to that. Um, so I'm going to do some quick wrap up. We're going to do some quick wrap up here and I'm going to fly through about three minutes about buses in a second. Um, but I just want to say, you know, my my mentor, uh, Dr. Ernest Morell, who's now at Notre Dame, used to we used to present with young people, with high school students when we were in Los Angeles. And he would always tell the high school students as they're going out to present to the mayor or legislators or community members, do not let the people in the room leave without knowing your marching orders, knowing what they can do. And so I think in that spirit, we have marching orders that we want to share uh, with all of you as we kind of move into this next step. Yeah, and um, we would love for you guys to subscribe and we would like you guys to do it since yesterday, but you can do it today. And our theory of change is that people can be better humans and change this narrative if they encounter our stories. Yeah, uh, so really, I think, you know, even if you are not, uh, if, if you don't have the label of being undocumented, we would love for you to share this with other people. We would love to hear the questions that you would like to ask, right? Like this is a space where we're trying to open up communication. So if there's ever things that you've wanted to know about, reach out here because we would love to, we have, we have many, many writers who would love to, who are, who are eager to offer some expertise. And so we'd love to hear from you, even if you don't think that you have space in this, in this place, right? If you can't find a connection here, I think that's, that's a, a failure on both of our parts in this way. Um, and so really, like, how do we move beyond um, counting up numbers, right, which I think is the irony of La Quinta, to thinking about kind of big perspective work around this. Um, for sake of time, I'm going to like zoom through just a couple of thoughts around school buses um, in like four minutes. That way we can have a little bit of time for some question and answer at the end, if that's okay. And so uh, this work comes from this little book, and you can read it all for free uh, at this tiny URL. It's called All Through the Town, The School Buses Educational Technology. Um, I shared this quote from Roy P, right, that technology reshapes who we are by changing what we do. Um, and so my argument in this book, and I've written this with a couple of graduate students and, and now a doctor, um, Dr. Stephanie Robillard, um, Dr. Miroslav Suzara, or uh, not doctor yet, doctoral candidate Miroslav Suzara, and doctoral candidate uh, Jorge Garcia, um, that, the that the school bus, the public school bus, the yellow school bus here in the United States uh, is the greatest form of disruption of educational technology in America. Um, in order to think about that, there's two kinds of technologies that are at play. There's the bus itself. It's this big, ugly thing that kind of moves around um, and kind of transports us around in different kinds of ways. Uh, and then there's also busing, right, which is kind of our de facto language for, for school desegregation. Um, and so I want to I introduce Kayla just really briefly um, as maybe like a, a, a way to kind of think about her experience. Kayla was a kindergartner when I was doing this research. Uh, and every morning, Kayla woke up. Um, in a working class community near uh, Stanford. Um, and she uh, she would wake up a, at six in the morning to get on the school bus uh, and would then spend a 90 minute ride to get to a more wealthy affluent part of the community around Stanford. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, and, and she, would have, she would have a two hour ride back home, right? And Kayla did this every day. There's no bathroom on the school bus. She's not allowed to eat on the school bus. And so you just think of the kind of human tax, right? If we think of, of costs in the same way, right? The costs that of what does Kayla lose out on as a result of her wider, more affluent peers getting to sleep in, getting to go to after school programs, going to dance or music classes after school while Kayla's on the school bus, right? What is what is the cost, like the thousands and thousands of hours that cross her school career in order for Kayla to go on the school bus? She's one of more than 700,000 students in California who ride the school bus every single day. 
Um, and all of this is a response. This was our response to the Brown versus Board of Education response in 1954. This is at the same time that Dwight D. Eisenhower, Eisenhower introduced the highway system as we know it. So we can think of these two things, these two kinds of disruptions were happening in the United States at the exact same time, right? That there is this school bus innovation and this highway innovation, which allowed people to kind of mass transportation in ways that didn't exist before. Uh, and so this is where I'm gonna kind of um, sneak over and kind of sneak past a bunch of this work just for sake of time. We ended up doing some participatory work. It's pretty cool, read it in the book. I'm also happy to talk with folks after this. Um, where young people were, were kind of measuring the sound on the school bus together and kind of understand, understanding what was happening around them. Um, and we found out young people have a whole lot to say about how they might redesign the school bus. How do you make it more comfortable? Um, but we don't actually take what young people say seriously in this country, right? That's the fundamental problem uh, with this work. But this work started uh, in the summer of 2019, uh, and we were following kids through the school year. Um, but then uh, there was this global pandemic. And so we stopped riding the school bus with kids because the kids were no longer riding the school bus during the global pandemic. And it meant that Kayla um, got extra sleep, right? She didn't have to ride the school bus anymore, but she's now geographically isolated from, um, from the rest of the world. And so we thought about like, what are the alternatives? What does it look like, right? We spent so much time as a country thinking about learning loss with young people and not thinking about ways we might trans transform what's happening around them. And so maybe as like a way to kind of wrap this up, I'll point to every day that we're on the bus and kind of like trying to get home. We're on this like one road called Woodside trying to get to the 101 freeway. Um, and for some reason, I always feel like these white buses were moving faster than us, even though we're all in the same traffic. They always seem like they are faster, like they had like a magic um, lane or something. But these are the these are the buses that um, uh, that Facebook, that uh, Google, that Apple, that Twitter um, drive their their employees around the, the Silicon Valley, right? They're these beautiful white buses. You need to be an employee to ride on them. So I don't know, but I imagine there's like there's a barista inside. I imagine there's like a masseuse who's there to give you a massage. I imagine there's like there's definitely a bathroom. There's probably Wi-Fi on the bus, right? And so we know that there's more comfortable ways to ride the bus than the yellow school bus that we have kids ride every day. Um, and so knowing that that's the case, right? It's not about fixing the school bus. Right? It's about thinking about what are new ways to imagine this, right? And I think this is how I want to link this back to La Fuentes or Rapid Fear, right? That it's not about fixing an immigration system. It's about imagining an otherwise, right? Imagining what things could look like, right? So maybe it's like three kinds of wrap-up questions for us to kind of come back and we'd love to see if other folks have other kinds of questions. Um, uh, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, so one, how are you creating spaces? So I'm now speaking to you all as educators and researchers. How are you creating spaces for safety, empathy, and expertise with historically marginalized community members? Those might be folks uh, who have identities like yours. They might not be. And how are you leveling the kinds of positionality and privilege that are afforded in these hierarchical relationships? How do your tools and methods center the expertise of the world around you? Right? How are we making things better? I think is like this fundamental thing I want us to be thinking about. And, and lastly, I think from a design perspective, what might the world look like if you're designing in this way, right? What, what's the better world look like? What's the alternative, right? It's not, I think, you know, we imagine that borders or capitalism are these fixed things, but we know if you go back in history, not that long ago, a couple of generations ago, these things didn't exist, right? The thing that makes someone quote unquote undocumented uh, is human imagination, right? Someone, someone invented that and, and it works, right? It works like in a very strong way. But it doesn't have to be that way. So what, what might the world look like otherwise is I think what we want to push towards. We want to again um, thank both Christian and Laura and we're hoping they'll, they'll join in with the, the very limited time we have for Q&A here. Um, we want to thank you both and, and Laura for the art that we've, we've stolen throughout this presentation. Um, we hope you all join our Substack uh, and feel free to reach out with other questions. We're happy to kind of answer things for you. But thank you uh, and thank you Anna and Real Nice State for, for your time. Maybe I'll stop sharing here so we can all just not have to stare at something. Yeah, so we can invite people um, to add questions in the chat um, or in the Q&A. There's a couple of options. Um, those of you in the pan as panelists as well um, in the room that you can also just unmute if you have a question as well. Um, we do just have a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear what questions. There was one that came up in the chat, um, Ontario. I don't know if you can see that one. Um, about navigating, yeah. how, how, do, how, how are you 
balance, how are you dealing with that tension of trying to change? Yeah. Right. Um, uh, uh, let's see. How do you change how we conceptualize research while also existing within an academic system yeah. that values only certain types? I, mean, I guess the good thing is I feel fairly, this is, a, this is a pessimistic answer for folks who might be students, but I feel fairly pessimistic about the role of academic research in making meaningful change in the world right now. Like I think of uh, I think of the lack of conversation that's happening around global conflict right now. I think of the lack of conversation that's going to happen as we think of a big election coming up, right? Like all of these things are, are big and important. Um, and so part of how I navigate this is I try to, you know, for all of the work that's public facing, there's a bunch of academic writing that we've done, right? We've written a couple of op-eds, mm -hmm. there's, there's other kinds of scholarly writing that's happening. And so I still make sure I'm checking off the boxes of like tenure requirements of the things that would make me employed if I was a doctoral student at this time. Um, but, you know, if I believe strongly, and I do in participatory research where I'm trying to get out of the way for other expertise to center, um, I just want to name that, like, to do that, right, we have enough, you can, you can, you can put in the right citations and then do the work that you want to do, right? There's enough of us who've done this work in the literacy space and the education space that you can cite this scholarship, you can talk, do, do, do activist work and then call it a social design-based experiment and cite Chris Gutierrez, right? Like, I think, like, like, do the important work and then, put some senior scholar's name behind it as the reason why you're doing it. Um, just seems like a thing you can do. My, my dog's gonna agree with me. He's gonna probably bark because my, my kids are coming in. Um, not to hog the space again with another question, but I'm curious about with buses, do you have any optimism or hope that there might be any changes or reforms or the buses of the 1980s and 90s that are the buses of today are they going to be the buses of 2030 and 42 uh i mean i think they the way they update the bus is the way they update our classroom they keep putting in tools for surveillance right they keep putting in cameras and gps trackers and things like that uh so so they're they're worse i think than the buses in the past by by updating them so maybe that's that's not, that's the, I guess that's pessimism. I guess not optimism. Um, I, I think, I think my optimism is uh, the more and more we think about conversations around mental health and resilience in schools, right? And the pandemic has helped kind of center parts of this conversation. The more we should realize that, you know, we spend a whole bunch of time thinking about what happens to kids in school, but there's this like big limbo period of getting kids to school that we just don't spend time wanting to invest in. And so maybe that's like a way to kind of position this. Um, I'm, as 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 my other answers are suggesting, I'm not particularly optimistic about a lot in schools right now. But uh, but uh, but I am optimistic that like we're showing up and having this conversation right now. Maybe that's the maybe that's the, the space. You've become more pessimistic over time, Ontario. Sure, yeah. well, <laughs> I've noticed. I've noticed a trend. <laughs> we do have one more question. Um, and and this this could go to anyone. Um, how do we navigate that pressure of prompting someone, inviting someone to share a story, and then the feeling like you have to sh share the story, right, to move a conversation forward, or, or that, oh, I, I, I owe a story to this cause or this, this work. I'm curious if Laura or Christian, you have any thoughts around that? Um, I don't know. It's, it's difficult to write stories like this. It's not an easy task. You can't write something without um, reflecting on what it means to you or what it's done to you, um, you know, and how it has affected you. So I think personally, in my own experience of writing, it's a, it's a healing process. It's um, coming to terms what it was like and then understanding what it has done to you and then how to move forward with that story. Um, if you, I mean, at least for me, if I don't write it, I don't know if I can really look at the bigger picture of what it is that happened to me or what this label means for me. And um, also that it doesn't really define me. So I don't know if it's pressure. Um, I guess if you're not ready to tell that story, you just don't. And if you are ready to tell it, you will. And then you start to realize that I've never write a story like this. So it would be really nice to um, write it so that someone else um, could read it because there's so many stories that I wish that I could have read at that time. Where are the undocumented mothers? Um, where are the undocumented students at, you know, at the time? There are more now, but back then there wasn't any. 
So I think it's just about a personal journey into these stories and sharing the stories really. Thank you so much to each of you for your contributions, um, both to La Cuenta and to tonight in the conversation. Uh, I I remember reading your piece about uh, motherhood when when it was first posted, and and just tonight uh, it's taking me back um, to that. And and so I appreciate um, the 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 um, the contribution that you made with the story, and then you know con continuing that as. It's, it's not, it wasn't just something you just did one time, right? Because um, it's continuing to live and, and push our conversations and our understandings forward. So really appreciate that um, to each of you. All right. Thank you, everyone.